Hey everyone, I'm Clark Wolf, back for another Show Me More, and this one is special. We're going behind the scenes for a final look at one of AMC's most iconic series. But just to warn you, there are major spoilers ahead. So if you missed any of these episodes, now is a great time to go watch them. This is the end of The Walking Dead. The Walking Dead is more than just a television show for me. I have lived with this story and these characters for most of my adult life. It's literally become a part of my career, and it's hard to believe that it's finally over. I don't think anyone saw the franchise becoming the cultural and global phenomenon it is today. But 177 episodes later, we've witnessed The Walking Dead spawn spin-offs, action figures, video games, Twitch streams, and turn Comic-Con into an absolute frenzy. I know, I was there. And to the fans who have been there from the beginning, you're the real deal. I am doing this for you. Getting ready to watch the final eight episodes, it was such a pleasant surprise to see that each one began with a montage of iconic Walking Dead moments. And I loved the writer's decision to have Judith's voice narrate the story of the heroes I've grown to love and will truly miss. Some people survive by connecting with each other. Let's take a trip down memory lane to hear more from the cast and crew about how the show paid tribute to seasons past. Sometimes I wonder if it takes more courage to live or die. Oh, oh. We wanted to make sure that we were doing some sort of tribute to the series as a whole. And one of the things we wanted to show is that there are these kind of emotional flashback pieces that are at the beginnings of the episode that sort of comment in some way on what's in the episode. Together, there's hope. We are gonna get our kids, take back our home, and make it right. That was just one of our ways that we were kind of paying tribute to the journey that these characters have been on, but it really does tie specifically to the community that they're in because the Commonwealth judged people so much on who they used to be. Not a scientist. And then part of what we wanted to show is a callback to previous moments. Sometimes it's really, really subtle, and sometimes it's a little more direct. There really are so many great moments in these final episodes that will give the audience this opportunity to say, this reminds me of the iconic scenes of The Walking Dead. I think my favorite is the finale with Judith in the hospital, where she's sort of unconscious and kind of waking up. That really reminded me of Rick waking up in the hospital. And even when Daryl has to leave Judith and uses a, a gurney to block the door to her, you know, that's what Shane did back in season one. It felt like very much a full circle moment for the show. I absolutely loved that they put in sort of this final meal for all of the characters together. It's certainly something we've done in the show over time. You know, there was the big sort of dream sequence meal when Glenn and Abraham got killed. And even going back to season one, when the characters first get to the CDC, they sort of have this, you know, almost celebratory meal because they feel like they found a safe place. <laughs> There are so many parallels between Judith and Carl. Uh, please, man, please. Please don't kill me, man, please. Please. In some ways, the Judith of the series took over the role of Carl from the comic book. We don't do child walkers very often, but when we do, they definitely have big meaning. And for Maggie in that moment where she doesn't know where Herschel is and, and she's feeling scared and that she failed protecting him, it is unsettling in a different way than a regular walker. And certainly starting the entire series with the little girl walker that Rick finds at the gas station, it is a nice callback moment to that as well. It's 11 years and these characters have changed so much. Just to see them from the past versus to where they are now is so potent. 
It's such a contrast. It's gotta be the brain. Do y'all know nothing? It taught me a lot that first season. It was just us in the woods and that group of actors in the beginning, it was such an honor to work with them. We had the right people in place, and then we just kept going, and it worked. Everybody felt equal. Everybody felt wow. just as important to the story as anyone else. Coming into this show that was such a big deal, I think I just kind of fit in with everybody, and it worked out. Where's the A-team off to? Here I am, <laughs> how many years later? <laughs> I'm shocked. I don't think anybody can ever plan on doing 11 seasons. It's just a really special bond that we have, that we will always have. I can't even believe how lucky we've been to have this. We've done something great here, and we've got something to be so proud of in, in how we've been able to do this for so long. When it comes to big stunts and action sequences, The Walking Dead has always delivered. And that's thanks in large part to the stunt coordinator, Monty Simmons, who's been working on the show since the shootout at Terminus in season five. There were so many exciting stunts in the final chapter that we couldn't pick just one. So let's count down some of our favorites. Episode 18, it's literally just complete chaos. We had large amount of extras, stunt people, and getting all those moving pieces together was quite challenging. All the little scenes we had going on within this chaos with Sebastian and Eugene and Max. We had a double for Max, and Josh, the actor who plays Eugene, was really letting our double have it. It's so important when you're using weapons that Everybody is aware of what's going on and that we know that we're safe. Give me the gun. They need our help. And Monty does a really good job about that. He's just the best. <laughs> the scene where Daryl is chasing the trooper on a motorcycle. We did that at the studio, one of our dirt roads and that's Norman on the bike for a lot of that stuff. Obviously, when we got off road and we're riding down and through the trees and stuff, that's all Josh Romeo, his stunt double. It's cool to watch all the stunts, but the motorcycle ones I think are pretty cool. You're always watching out for safety and seeing how realistic things are. To get that bike to slide that far under the tree, you'd have to be going really, really fast. Dave Cutler was my trooper on the motorcycle. He's an excellent motorcycle rider. And for the shot where the bike is now on its side and sliding towards the trooper, we hooked a cable to the motorcycle. We yelled action and everything takes off at the same time and the bike catches up with him and sweeps him and he did a great reaction to being hit by the motorcycle and ends up on the ground. And Amor! I'm Monty Simmons here from the set of Walking Dead. We've been doing some car chases today. Troopers chasing Negan. He's trying to get back to the Commonwealth. Daryl to the rescue. T-bones the troopers, crashes them into this uh, this intersection right here. Monty looks at stunts, you know, he's very adult about it, but he's got a very childlike enthusiasm for the stunts, so they're fun to do. The T-bone crash, how we do it is we start at the end, we put those cars exactly where we want them, and then you basically back those cars up, and they are connected through these cables and shivs on the ground and motivated by a car off camera. That's what actually pulls them to the spot so that you know exactly where the wreck is gonna happen, which is important for camera, and you know the speed it's gonna happen at. You basically know in general where those cars are gonna go so that you can set up what we call catch cars so that we don't have a car go flying off and slam into a building or something like that. That trooper dummy that was hanging out of the sunroof took a beating. 
Greg Nicotero, our director, was very pleased. It was quite a successful day. Now, you can't have The Walking Dead without walkers. It's the main ingredient. And getting the walker design right from the beginning was key. So we turned to the special makeup effects mastermind, Greg Nicotero, to take us through the evolution of the show's most iconic walkers. Before The Walking Dead existed, zombies appealed to a very select group of people. So it was exciting to bring it to the masses. For me, what was really important was to create memorable looking zombies that people would, number one, be afraid of, and number two, want to study, want to see more of. In the first season, a lot of the makeups were 3D prosthetic transfers that were glued on with some good paint jobs. As the show evolved, we evolved the look of the zombies to show that they were more and more deteriorated. We really wanted them to be expressive and scary. And there were a lot of great moments where there were people were right up against zombies that were pretty terrifying. We probably have five or 600 different molds for different zombie looks. I always feel that each walker really told a story. We were always sort of deconstructing how they died and then putting that element into the actual makeup. So for me, what made me proud was having forensic pathologists and people come to me and just say, why is everything look so real? Like the, the anatomy, the musculature, the bone, the ligaments, everything looks so real because that was what we were going for. The moment with Lenny James where he's trying to aim the gun at his wife, it wasn't just the fact that she showed up at the door and was looking through the people and wiggling the doorknob. That's one thing. There's a monster outside, but it's more about what this is doing to our people. Come on, come on. And I think that really, for me, was the moment when I realized that Walking Dead was something special. The idea of the variant walkers really goes all the way back to season one, episode two. There's a moment where you see a zombie pick up a rock, could smash windows, or they could climb. Elements that we had established in season one that made the walkers a bit more agile. How the hell, the walker? Do that. When we got into the last season, there was a lot of discussion about We're not breaking the rules because these rules were established in the beginning of the show. There are, are a tremendous number of people that we've used over and over again. These people have to bring the makeups to life, otherwise they all look like masks. We had zombie schools for years where I would put performers through their motions. And I had a phone book and I would grade each one of them. And then at the end, we would take the top 40 people. And a lot of them are still doing it today. It makes me proud, you know? I mean, it, it makes me proud that these people have dedicated so much of their time sitting there being transformed and they create friendships and relationships with the people in the chairs. We kind of all have gone through this unique experience that no one else would ever be able to explain and no one else could ever take that away from us. The penultimate episode had me on the edge of my seat when Judith takes a bullet for Maggie. We all wondered if this was going to be the end of her story. I actually thought that she was gonna die. But fortunately, she made it. Whew. Here's what Kaylee Fleming and the show's creators had to say about filming one of the most shocking scenes of the season. Get down! It's 
it's one of those moments where you just go, <gasps> oh my gosh, what is happening? Holy shit, Judith got shot. <laughs> is she gonna die? Is it the end of her story? You know, I was sort of horrified. I was like, no, not Judith. This is a world where horrific things happen to people and children are often caught in the crosshairs. This is no longer just about the group as a whole. This is no longer just about the Commonwealth itself. This is about Judith. And Judith is one of the most beloved and important characters on the show. We gotta go! We gotta go now! Judith steps in front of Maggie because she's a hero. Judith has been raised to be selfless as much as possible, but she has that trait within her. There's something about Judith that is so pure in intent. We'll be back soon, all right? Till then, mind your sister. Yeah? I'm coming. This is a child of the apocalypse. She has lost a lot of people, and yet she has this foundation of family and love and protection that is so ingrained in her that that is who she will always be. What we're doing could help everyone. Not just us, but maybe everybody everywhere. I want to be part of that, make what my family believed in real. If there's one thing that Judith would fight for, it's her family. She would literally do anything for them. She knows that they would do the same for her, and I think she thinks it's her duty to protect him, even though they're the adults. I don't know how to put myself in those shoes. Like, I don't know what I would do, but She's a lot braver than I am. The director of that episode, Sherrod, had a really amazing plan that was a very complex scene to shoot overall because we were using all four sides of that set. We had cast members in pockets all over the place, so he shot it in pieces. Sherrod is a brilliant director. He kind of guided me along the whole process, having to show her making that decision in her brain. Looking at Pamela, looking at Maggie, oh shoot, what's about to happen? Keely is, is so smart. I mean, she's smart beyond her years. She understands the process of movie making. We got out some big, soft stunt pads and we walked her through it. It was such a close shot that I couldn't plug in a stunt double. And she did such a good job. Everybody was so supportive. It was so sweet. They were cheering me on. The support that you just feel from your family is unmatched. I like the way that everyone came together to protect you. She became the center focus. There's always that thing when you end a series of, of what happens to these characters next. And I hope the audience takes away the idea that Judith is gonna be okay. She has made her peace with this world. She understands the risks. She understands what's at stake. She has such a good heart and such a good moral compass. Judith Grimes is Judith Grimes. And that is the legacy, I think, of the entire story. We get to start over. We're the ones who live. Judith making that sacrifice is why she's my favorite character on the show. And I'm so glad she survives. In between all the hard work from the cast and crew to create the final season, there were also some laughs along the way. And luckily for you, the cameras were rolling. And even though it's bittersweet to see our final round of outtakes, it's a reminder of how damn fun it was to make this show. Be Mark. Yay. <laughs> Jeffrey, you're okay. Were we shooting at or was that just all? Yes, we were. Woohoo! Ah! Hey, cut. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, good. Wait, were we taking that? Uh oh, yeah, we were. Yeah. <laughs>
We need to get these supplies to Ocean Side. <laughs> we need to get these supplies to Ocean Side. <laughs> Walking Dead truly wouldn't be what it is without the genius that is Greg Nicotero. He directed some of our favorite episodes and even played some of the walkers. Yeah. We sat down for more with the legend himself to hear about his preparation to direct the final episode. And we asked Angela Kang and Scott Gimple about writing the end of an era. It's been such a long, amazing ride. We got to do something really, really cool for a long time. Help me! Going into our finale, I think there's always that question mark. How can we pull it off and make it amazing? Yes, there's this chaos and the bullets are flying. And then this just focuses all of that insanity into this one moment. And I loved how Greg shot it. We really were dedicated to send the show out in a way that it deserved to go out. Let's try you landing on that. I was so excited when I found out he was directing the last episode since Greg directed my first one. It was a good closure for me. What was really important was to make sure that at the end of the show, the zombie threat was still very, very prevalent. A lot of the action scenes were intended to be very adrenalized so that they felt exciting. You gotta move! Run! Greg is one of my favorite directors for sure. He's really good at listening to actors and working with the writers, and he kind of finds the heart of the moment. I really wanted to honor the fans, honor the characters, and honor the legacy of the show. The last week was the toughest. Every day was somebody's last day. And action. You have to help them, Governor. I would have to wrap an actor and know that it was their last scene. It was probably the hardest thing that I've ever done. All right, hey, guys. That is a three draft on Ian. It was just really hard to say goodbye since we were never going to all be together again. I'm going to do that. There was tears, <laughs> blood, sweat, and tears. It's not like we're never going to see each other again. Great joy of this show was finding out who the apocalypse made these characters into. I am so sorry for what I took from you. And seeing a group of strangers become family. Hey, the last kicker. Hey, big ass kicker. Christian came to me and said, I think it's Rosita's time to go. She should do something heroic. She would die for her daughter. And so I thought, let's give Rosita a beautiful and impactful end. Christian is incredibly smart. Rita, come on! She saw an opportunity to heighten the story. We felt privileged to watch her and this character in an incredible way. Rest in peace. We'll see you again someday. 
ultimately it's about these relationships. It's about these people and how they interact with each other. The stuff that we shot the last day was probably the most emotional. Who's not ready? <laughs> we were dealing with a lot of people not knowing how they were gonna feel about the show being over. The last shot we did was actually a visual effects element of zombies burning, walking towards the camera. There was a confetti, there were lights, there was champagne, there was music. It was like New Year's Eve with zombies. To see Greg finishing it out, to see him doing what he loves, it was just very, very bittersweet. I made a pact with the actors that I was not going to say goodbye. I said, I don't want to say goodbye because I'm going to be friends with you people for the rest of my life. And though we are not bonded by blood, we are family. All right, I can't hold it in any longer. Rick and Michonne have returned. It's not over. We all hoped that we'd hear from Rick and Michonne before the flagship series wrapped, but actually seeing them, I did not think that was gonna happen. I thought we'd hear them, I didn't think we'd see them, we got to see them. How awesome would it have been to be a fly on the wall for those last couple of days with Andrew Lincoln and Denai Guerrera? Oh wait, we were. The DNA of The Walking Dead has always been Rick Rhymes, and we followed him through several seasons, so it wouldn't feel like the finale of The Walking Dead if we didn't reintroduce his character to the show. We wanted to have the characters Rick and Michonne in the finale. We wanted an ending for them. The next step was then developing what the story would be. How would we integrate it into the current timeline. Rolling, rolling. It's been a while. And I realized, you know, being away from it, how much you miss it. In some ways, we were just saying, it feels like uh, like we never left. The energy was crazy. It was so great to see them come back onto the set. It wasn't originally scripted that I was going to kill uh, Walker. And basically, they just wrote one in. I said, I can't come 5,000 miles after four years and not kill and Denai's kicking ass, looking so bad as on horseback. We had one of my stunt walkers just cruising along, and Michonne's double comes riding up with a visual effects knife and lops off the head. A little tricky when you're dealing with horses and animals, and you've got a sword in the mix, and now you have uh, Michonne's whole new outfit that she's got on. There were showing for the first time. I have to give a massive shout out to Yulin Hufke, who's such an incredible designer, and she designed Michonne's original look on the show in season three, and working with her again on this is really, really exciting. It's like such a thrilling thing to put on. It feels so Michonne, but it's like kind of Michonne 2.0. Come on, Rick, there's no way out, and you're the only one who wants out anyway. We find Rick Grimes on a small little island in a river. It appears that he's hiding from people or, or has escaped from somebody. We have to turn this tiny little snake pond into the Delaware River with Philadelphia destroyed in the background. We have to create all these walkers that are buried and drowned and just floating around. So we have a lot of blue screen work. I think it's the most blue screen I've gotten to put up on this show in any one day and just a lot of pieces we have to make and make it look realistic. I don't know why I fell in love with you. Because you're a fighter. We created this piece of art form that bonds people together. And it's really something that I, I can't even put into words how proud I am. Let's go. I came to this series as a fan and uh, luckily I get to leave as a fan. Without you guys, without the fans, we wouldn't be here. And I've loved this part. I love him. I missed Ricky Dicky Doo Dog Rhymes. So I'm very, very happy that you're still tuning in, you know? The ambition is to give you a thrill ride and something that certainly I think is gonna be the right way to finish this, this story that's been so important to me.
Walking Dead may have been my first love, but there's still so much more to look forward to. It's only goodbye for now. We'll finally be reunited with Rick and Michonne at last, Daryl's on his own in France, and Maggie and Negan are heading to New York City. Here's a sneak peek at what's coming. Hey, Mark. We're here on the set of Dead City, and we are telling the story of Maggie and Negan a few years in the future. And we're in New York City, and it's such a new world for them. And now we are up against a whole new threat. It's an urban show with urban environments, and 10 years of an urban environment and situations that have grown in those 10 years, whether it be the walkers, or whether it be the very different kinds of cultures and communities that have sprung up in post-apocalyptic Manhattan, it's just, it's just really crazy. And then you put two characters that have a very disturbing connection, but it's a connection nonetheless, and they're, you know, in some ways trapped with each other. And it's an explosive situation where they can't get away from one another. What can I teach you about the spinoff? Norman's spinoff is off and running. Locations are being scouted in Europe. I've been out there for a little bit, and I've been going on the location scouts and so forth. It's epic. It's going to be epic. He's alive out there. I will find him. The Rick and Michonne story needs to be told and needs to be able to wrap up that element of The Walking Dead. It's gonna really be a journey, an epic journey of an epic love story between these two people who are gonna figure out how to find each other again in a world that is very different for both of them than what it was when they last saw each other. The ambition is to, you know, tell a story in the way that we began it, with the same suspense, the same surprises, and tell this thrilling, epic love story. And also, hopefully, give a bit of a bird's eye view of, you know, what's happening in the bigger world. Thanks for watching Show Me More. Remember, you can catch up on the entire Walking Dead universe on AMC Plus, the AMC site and apps, and on demand. Aw, I told myself I wouldn't cry. Just happy tears. Okay, just go to the credits.